academic freedom and freedom Order. of speech. Senator Rustin, debate will be in continuation. Questions without notice. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Today, hundreds of thousands of Australian women are marching for justice, raising their voices, saying enough is enough that sexism, sexual harassment and sexual assault must stop. Instead of joining these women just metres from the front entrance, the Minister for Women sat in this chamber for the debate on a bill she had no responsibility for. Why? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, I welcome the exercise of open democracy that all of those who have participated today, men and women, uh, have taken up to provide their views, uh, both in demonstration and through the form of a petition. And the parliament and the government will, of course, give appropriate consideration to the March Order. for Justice petition. Order, Senator the process of parliament and of being a minister means that we meet with hundreds of people every year in the parliament. And it's the responsibility of any elected government to form positions on those imported, important issues by working through those carefully as a government through and through the parliament. It's what we are elected to do. It's our responsibility to listen to the concerns of all Australians. Both the Prime Minister and I have sought to do that with organisers of today's protest uh, directly uh, and to hear from them directly uh, in, a number of, in a number of ways. I do take those concerns very seriously, as do my coalition colleagues. And the Prime Minister's offer of that meeting with organisers still stands. Supplementary question, Senator Wong. Order. Senator Wong. Instead of listening to the hundreds of thousands of women marching for justice by joining them on the lawns in front of Parliament House, the Prime Minister remained in this building. Why? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. I think uh, the Prime Minister has said uh, in uh, his uh, comments on this matter that it is not his uh, usual approach to uh, to take uh, to engage in uh, in an action such as that outside the chamber. That is not his usual approach. But he has, on a number of occasions, with a number of different uh, representatives of community uh, and on a number of different issues, always sought to offer uh, the opportunity for a private meeting directly with the prime minister, uh, the highest office holder in our system, the highest office holder in this country. Uh, in, in order the, on my left. In the context of this process, he has done the same, has offered that opportunity to those who have organised today's protest and to, to those who wish to raise these issues. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Ms Brittany Higgins spoke to the March for Justice on Parliament House lawns today. She spoke with great courage. And she said, and I quote, this isn't a political problem, it is a human problem. Well, the Morrison government stopped treating this as a political issue and start listening to Australian women. Order. Order. And start listening to Australian women. Order. <laughs> Order. I need to be able to hear the question. Order and start listening to the Australian women who are saying across this country enough is enough. Senator, order. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I have had the opportunity to uh, scan Ms Higgins' remarks today, and there is a range of those statements that she has made today with which I agree, and in fact the concerns that she has raised over recent weeks with which I also agree. It's one of the reasons the government has worked closely with those opposite, uh, with those around this chamber indeed, uh, to uh, in support of the development of an independent review of this workplace, its cultures, uh, its, uh, its uh, unique qualities 
to specifically and directly address these issues because we do take this very, very seriously. We have heard those concerns and my own personal remarks, which I am very happy to repeat in this chamber, Mr President, are that we must own, as parliamentarians, all of us, these problems. We must own the failings that have caused these or enabled these events to occur, and we must own the Order. solutions. Senator Payne. Senator Askew. You, My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison government is helping people to have the tools and confidence to ensure that disrespectful behaviours are not learned in childhood? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Askew for her very important question. I'm very pleased today to be able to advise the Chamber that uh, last night the first ads in Stage 3 of the Stop It at the Start campaign began airing on national television. We did this um, along uh, with a number of other measures to make sure that we gave the Australian public the tools and the confidence to be able to call out disrespectful behaviour when they see it because we know that early intervention is absolutely the key uh, in giving adults um, the opportunity to make sure that they can play a role in making sure that all Australians feel safe in their own home, in their communities and online. Um, last week, to mark International Women's Day, Minister Payne and I announced and launched uh, the third phase of, of this campaign which is absolutely targeted at the prevention of family and domestic violence uh, perpetrated against women and their children. What the Stop at the Start campaign does is it challenges disrespectful attitudes and behaviours that can often be learnt in childhood and, if left unchecked, may uh, escalate into violence. And specifically, the campaign is about telling Australians to unmute themselves, to speak up. If you see disrespectful behaviour, don't ignore it, don't excuse it you need to speak up and call it out. We know that research um, which we've conducted shows that four out of five of us agree that disrespectful behaviour um, and violence against women is absolutely driven by disrespectful behaviour. But many people do not feel confident to call out that disrespectful behaviour when they see it, because each and every one of us does have a role to play in making sure that every one of us feels safe. So taking action um, on this issue may seem overwhelming. Um, but if we all take small steps together and we show respect, then maybe, maybe we actually can change the dial here. Because we know that not all disrespectful behaviour results in violence, but all violence has started with disrespectful behaviour. Order. Senator ask you a supplementary question. Thank you. Order. Order. Senator Askew has the call. Order on my right. Senator Askew. Can the minister explain how the Morrison government is supporting Australians who are experience, experiencing or at risk of experiencing domestic violence? Senator Rustin. Thank you very Order much, Mr. Mr. President. Um, there is no excuse for family or domestic violence. And last year, during the COVID pandemic, we were faced with a potential crisis which we sought to respond to by providing $150 million of domestic violence response package to make sure that the states and territories had the frontline capacity to be able to respond to any increases in domestic violence as a result of the lockdowns from the COVID pandemic. This is in addition to the $340 million that, I, that we have uh, the, a record investment into the fourth action plan uh, and also the guaranteeing of the ongoing uh, commitment to the 1800 Respect 24 um, hour, seven day a week hotline um, and making sure that future funding was locked in in perpetuity. We're currently in the process of out and we're consulting on the next plan, which will commence in 2022. And we want to make sure that we listen to all Australians, all people that are impacted, uh, to make sure that we have the best possible plan going forward. Senator, I ask you a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise what services are available for people experiencing domestic, family or sexual violence? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, we certainly understand that reaching out for help can be quite difficult for people. So to make sure that free and confidential advice is at the end of the phone at all times, um, we have funded the 1800 Respect and will continue to make sure that this service is available to 
every single Australian who may wish to, uh, to access advice, counselling, support or just merely to find out what they should do next in a situation of domestic violence. As I said, you know, during the, the coronavirus lockdown, there was a shift how people decided that they wanted to respond. Uh, and we saw a significant increase in the number of people that were seeking to use online and telephone services in, uh, in a way of accessing um, support. The national manager of 1800 Respect, Melanie Sheehan, said that more people were calling the service in the very late hours, closer to midnight, and we also saw an increase in people contacting us via web chat, as this may be when and how people feel more comfortable or safer to seek that support. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Last week, after months of anxiety for the tourism sector, the government finally released their package for the tourism industry when JobKeeper ends. Why did the Morrison government announce a package that, as the Australian Tourism Industry Council has said, will, and I quote, fail to stem major job losses and closures now occurring among many small, family-run and larger tourism businesses. The Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and thanks, Senator Farrell, for his uh, question. Mr President, uh, the Australian Government's uh, Tourism and Aviation Package, a $1.2 billion package, uh, combined with, of course, our vaccine rollout, which is uh, underway, is part of the Government's National Economic Recovery Plan. And what that means is, for the tourism sector, in many ways, the recovery will be driven by Australians holidaying at home until we are able to re-engage with the international tourism sector. And so it does, I acknowledge Senator Farrell, continue to be a very challenging time for our tourism and travel sector. So in addition to the record levels of economic support that we have provided during COVID-19, including JobKeeper and small business cash payments of up to $100,000, which has sustained literally hundreds of thousands of tourism businesses and jobs across Australia. The Order. tourism and aviation package, Mr President, provides further targeted assistance to help the tourism sector, to help them rebound and to save as many jobs as possible. What we will see in Austra with Australia's Order. airlines, with hotels, with caravan parks, with restaurants and bars, with travel agents and with tourism operators is Order. a push from Australian domestic tourists as part of that new support package. And, Mr President, that mix of half-price airline tickets, of uh, cheaper loans for business, of direct support to keep planes in the Order. air and airline workers in their jobs is a bridge back to a normal way of life for Australians. So the centrepiece of the program, Mr President, is a demand-driven program of 800,000 800, half-price airfares to get Australians travelling, to support tourism operators, businesses, travel agents and airlines who continue to do it tough through COVID-19 while our international borders remain closed. It means taking Order. more tourists to our hotels Time and cafes. The answer has expired. Mm. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Yes, I do have one. Thank you, Mr President. In response to the only demand driving element of the proposal, the chair of the Tourism Restart Task Force, Dr Jeremy Johnson AM, has said, and I quote, the discount airfares will do nothing for tour operators, travel agents and wholesalers. Is Dr Johnson correct? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I'm not familiar with Dr Johnson, but what I do know is that the tourism package itself will take more tourists to our hotels and our cafes, uh, taking tours, exploring basically their own Order. backyard. That does mean more jobs and the opportunities for investment from the tourism and aviation sectors. Senator and it Green. Is important for local communities, especially in regional Australia, because we Order will continue right to financially well. support flights which are so key to health services, to employment opportunities and to social activities. The half-price ticket program will initially operate to 13 key regions, which includes the Gold Coast, Cairns and Townsville, the Whitsundays and Mackay region, both Proserpine and Hamilton Island, the Sunshine Coast, Darwin, Lassiter and Alice Springs, Launceston, Hobart, Devonport and Burnie, Broome, 
Avalon, Marimbula and Adelaide and Kangaroo Island. Now, Mr President, in this chamber in recent weeks and months, I have Order. responded to questions on these issues, particularly around Tasmania, Order. particularly Senator around Payne, Queensland. And I know that in my Senator Payne, Se order across the chamber. Senator Farrell, a final Senator. supplementary question. If you can please uh, make sure the, uh, the minister keeps to within her time. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I do have a further supplementary question. The Accommodation Association of Australia has stated the lack of support in this package will result in the loss of jobs and slow our recovery once borders open. Why has the government abandoned 300,000 Australian workers? Senator Payne. I absolutely reject the premise of, Ms. of Senator Farrell's question, Mr President. There's a number of other new measures in the support package uh, which I hadn't previously had an opportunity to, uh, to speak to, including the expansion of the SME loan guarantee scheme as part of our commitment to support up to $40 billion in lending to small and medium enterprises, precisely the sorts of business that Senator Farrell is referring to, I presume. Under the existing scheme, over 35,000 loans. Of the chamber worth more than $3 billion have already been provided, which are Senator helping Watt. thousands of businesses get to the other side of this pandemic. What the SME scheme, recovery loan scheme will benefit from is an increased government guarantee, increasing from the current 50-50 split between the governments and the banks to an 80-20 split. Mr President, we also see the support provided through the new international aviation support, helping Australia's international passenger airlines to maintain more than 8,000 core international aviation jobs. Support for regular passenger airports Order. to meet their Senator domestic Payne, security time screening for the answer costs. Has expired. Senator Small. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. In the 14 days since the Prime Minister has released the final Order. report Sorry, from the Royal Commission please, into Small. Age. Senator Small, you can, I can't hear the question. Senator Small, you can commence the question again. I, I noted who it was directed to. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, in the 14 days since the Prime Minister has released it, can the Minister please update the Senate on the final report from the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and thanks, Senator Small, for your question. The final report, Mr President, of the Royal Commission was provided to the Australian Government on the 26th of February and publicly released following the table, tabling in the Parliament on the 1st of March. It is a very significant report. The final report, Care, Dignity and Respect, comprises eight volumes, totalling more than 2,500 pages and includes 148 recommendations. The Government thanks the Royal Commissioners, the Honourable Tony Pagoni, QC, Linnell Briggs, AO, and the Honourable Richard Tracy, AM, RFD, QC, for their considerable work in conducting the Royal Commission and to all of those who contributed throughout the course of the inquiry. The Royal Commission's report provided some very difficult reading. I thank all those brave individuals, families, carers, aged care workers, who gave evidence to the Commission under difficult circumstances. Mr President, and now we owe it to all of them to act on the recommendations of the report and acknowledge the significant and sweeping proposals required to reform the aged care sector. Mr President, we must do better. It was this government that called the Royal Commission and it will be this government that delivers. We will not shy away, Mr President, Order. from implementing the reforms needed to deliver the care our senior Australians require and deserve. The scale and scope of the report and the expectations of the Australian community demand a comprehensive understanding of its outcomes and its recommendations. We intend to provide a full response to the report by the 31st of May, as the recommendations of the Royal Commission ask. Senator Small, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate on the Australian government's response so far to the Royal Commission? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, and thanks, Senator Small. The government will immediately invest an additional $452.2 million as an initial step in responding to the, to the report. This includes $18.4 million 
to enhance the oversight of the government's home care packages program, to deliver better value for senior Australians and the Australian taxpayer. $32 million to immediately enhance the capacity of the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission and greater regulation around the use of restraints in aged care, as we've previously committed, and $189.8 million to residential aged care providers to provide stability and maintain services. And this equates to around $760 per resident in metropolitan residential aged care and 1,145 for those in rural and regional areas. Senator Small, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Can the minister outline what other measures the government has undertaken to implement in response to the Royal Commission? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Small, and I can. Uh, we have committed $90 million to support a viability fund to assist those facilities which are facing financial challenges particularly as the sector begins to restructure and to respond to the changing choices of people who to live at home for longer. $91.8 million to grow the skilled and professional aged care workforce, recruiting up to 18,000 uh, personal care workers into both home care and residential care, and $30.1 million to strengthen the governance of aged care providers and legislative governance obligations across the entire sector, Mr. President. Mr. President, this will be a significant reform for this country and for the aged care sector. And as I've said a number of times, it is this government's determination to ensure that those reforms are undertaken. And of course, as the Prime Minister and I have said, we will respond more fully to the recommendations of the Royal Commission in the budget. Senator Waters. Thanks uh, very much, President. My question is to the uh, Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. 100,000 people marched for justice today around the country, calling for an end to gendered violence and for equality and safety and respect. Brittany Higgins, Rochelle Miller, many survivors, powerful women of colour speakers were there. Uh, myself, our female senators, our Greens leader were there, as did, uh, many of our staff attended. Uh, many of the Labor MPs, their leader and their staff attended as well. Virtually no order. Liberal MPs attended order. Order. the march. Sorry, Senator Waters, I'll, I'll give you it. Order on my right. Order on my right. Order. Senator Waters, I'd ask you to commence from midway through the question I, I got through the, where, where you had up to staff attended. Thank you, President. Virtually no Liberal MPs attended. I commend those who did. But the Minister for Women wasn't there Order and the Prime right. Minister wasn't there. Despite many people travelling a long way to be there, the Prime Minister wanted women to come even further and have a closed-door meeting with him. He couldn't find 10 minutes to go and meet with them. One of the asks of the petition which I seek leave to table, signed by 70,000 people, is for action to implement the 55 recommendations of the Respect at Work inquiry. My question is when will we see action to implement uh, those recommendations and I seek leave to table this 70,000 strong petition Order. calling for that and, and other things. Is, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. I'll call uh, the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President, and, uh, and I thank Senator Waters for uh, her question. Uh, and indeed, I do acknowledge uh, those who have rallied in Canberra and elsewhere around the country today. Uh, I acknowledge the many important messages that were conveyed uh, in the remarks made by, uh, by various people speaking at those different rallies uh, and events. Uh, as Senator Payne has already uh, reinforced to the chamber, uh, the Prime Minister uh, invited uh, and the invitation continues to stand. Uh, representatives of those uh, who organised the rally and conducted the rallies uh, to come and to meet uh, with him and with any other senior members of the government uh, as they wish. Uh, and indeed, that is consistent uh, with many such uh, protests, rallies or other events that have taken place uh, over the years uh, and the work and the offer that, uh, that has been made on those occasions uh, and accepted by uh, event organisers and activists or others on those occasions. And I would encourage uh, those uh, organisers of this event uh, to reconsider uh, their refusal uh, to accept the Prime Minister's invitation 
uh, and to uh, and to have those uh, those meetings. Mr. President, in relation to uh, the recommendations and uh, and calls for action uh, in the petition that Senator Waters has just tabled, uh, there are a number of those uh, for which work is underway. I uh, thank all senators, including Senator Waters, uh, who cooperated uh, with me and the government in establishing the multi-party independent review into workplace practices. Uh, that uh, that was an important action to get underway and is one of those. Uh, one of those actions called for in the petition. In relation to the Respect at Work report, uh, the government is acting on a number of those recommendations already. Uh, that includes committing $2.1 million in the 2020-21 budget uh, to implement recommendations related to the establishment of the Respect Order. at Work Senator Council. Birmingham. Time for the answers expired. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. The Prime Minister's ministerial standards require ministers to act with integrity, accountability and in the public interest. The Prime Minister can call for an independent investigation into whether ministers meet those standards. Far from being a breach of the rule of law, this investigation is commonplace. It happened in the High Court. It happens across the private sector. It does not replace police investigations. It is a separate question as to whether the Attorney-General is suitable to hold the position of the highest law officer in the land. When will the Prime Minister order an independent inquiry into Minister order Porter's Senator fitness Waters. to be Attorney-General? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. Uh, I, do, I do note that the uh, analogy is, uh, is drawn, as it was by Senator Waters, and is often drawn by others uh, between uh, the investigation uh, that the High Court undertook uh, in relation to, uh, to former Justice uh, Dyson Hayden uh, and these other matters. Uh, indeed, the matters, uh, the matters that the High Court investigated, as many other um, entities do, uh, relate to uh, workplace harassment matters and allegations of what occurred in that particular workplace. Uh, there is a significant difference in relation to the type of investigation you would expect conducted on those matters compared with uh, criminal law allegations uh, that date back uh, a considerable period of time. Uh, the right and appropriate Order. way for criminal law allegations Order. to be investigated uh, in this country uh, is through the appropriate legal channels, uh, and the government absolutely stands by and supports Order. all of those independent law enforcement agencies to do their jobs. Order, Senator Birmingham. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Thank you, President. On a day when women are asking to be heard, Minister Porter is suing the female journalist uh, and the ABC, and that sends a message about silencing women. If this is designed to alleviate pressure for an internal Order inquiry, right. it won't work. Did the Prime Minister ask Minister Porter to launch the defamation action, and was it so that the government could try to brush aside further questions by claiming this matter is before the courts? Order. I ask for silence during the question so I can hear its terms. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Well, in relation to whether the Prime Minister requested any such action, I am confident the answer to that is no. Uh, in relation to the action uh, that Mr Porter has initiated, uh, as, uh, as I have said publicly previously, all Australians, all Australians are treated equally before the law. That includes the rights of all Australians not to be defamed and, if they believe they have been defamed, to take action in relation to those matters. That's what Mr Porter is doing. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. When the government announced its much-anticipated support package for the tourism industry, 13 regions had been identified for support. At that time, Darwin, Adelaide, Hobart and Townsville were not included in the successful list. A document quoted by the Hobart Mercury shows that these locations were in fact originally included, but then removed by the government at the last minute. Why were Adelaide, Darwin, Hobart and Townsville dumped from the government's announcement? The Minister representing the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. I thank Senator Chisholm for his uh, question. I uh, believe that I indicated uh, the locations uh, for the um, 
half-price ticket program uh, in my earlier response. Uh, I listed those to the Chamber. I indicated that uh, the uh, number of questions which I have received uh, on these matters from those opposite uh, in recent uh, times have specifically asked about uh, those locations. Uh, that these, what I was going Order. to say, Mr. President, before I completed my uh, or Order. before my time expired in my earlier response, was that uh, destinations were chosen in consultation with airlines in regards to relevant routes and using Austrade data to determine the regions who were uh, most impacted by the loss of international tourists. There is capacity to add to the list based on further consultation, based on consumer order. demand, Payne, based on the capacity of 13 of destinations. I have Senator Payne, I have Senator Farrell on a point of order. Senator Farrell? The um, point of order is uh, relevant, uh, Mr President. The question is a very simple one. Why were those four towns, Townsville, um, Hobart, um, Adelaide, and um, Darwin uh, originally on the list and taken off the list. Uh, I'm listening very carefully to the minister's answer. I allowed you to restate that part of the question, Senator Farrell. I'm going to continue to listen, but the minister was going to the very point of the de determination of which places were included, which at my, I'm, I'm going to consider that to be directly relevant. I can't instruct you on the terms in which to answer. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. As I was saying, the destinations were chosen in consultation with airlines in regards to relevant routes and using Austrade data to determine the regions most impacted by the loss of international tourists. I indicated to the Chamber that there is capacity to add to the list based on further consultation, based Order. on consumer demand and the capacity of the 13 destinations Order and the success of the program. As I understand it, Mr President, the Prime Minister has said that this is in an initial list of destinations and that more routes will be added. Indeed, after further consultation Order. with airlines, industry and advice from Austrade, Townsville, Hobart, Darwin and Adelaide have been added to the initial roll-out list. Order. Order. Senator Payne has concluded her answer. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. In a confusing and embarrassing series of backflips, Darwin, Adelaide, Hobart and Townsville have now been re-added to the list, only days after the announcement. If these locations were chosen based on actual need rather than political targeting, why were they dumped from the original announcement only to be embarrassingly re-added? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I'm very disappointed that those opposite do not seem to support the inclusion of Townsville, Hobart, Darwin and Adelaide. Order. I'm deeply disappointed Order. by that, Mr President, because that would Order. seem, that my, would seem my right. to not Order. be particularly Senator Payne, representative Senator of their Wong obligations on a point of order. On as my senators right, in Senator this Payne, place to on a point of order. Order. I'll call Senator Wong when there's silence. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. The point of order is direct relevance. The question isn't uh, whether, or what, what the opposition's position is. The question is why the government, why the government took, them, took these locations out, then put them back in. It's a very simple proposition. Now, the minister might want to obfuscate by creating straw people arguments, but the question is, your announcement, why were they taken out and then re-added? So on, on the point of order, it is, it is not directly relevant to be making observations about the motives of those asking questions. It is, however, directly relevant if the minister is talking about the determination of the locations. I can't instruct her to inspect a premise, but it is not, a, it is not directly relevant to assign a motive to the uh, people asking a question. Senator Payne to continue. Thank you, Mr President. I believe, Mr President, that I had said to the Chamber that after further consultation with the airlines and industry and advice from Austrade, Townsville, Hobart, Darwin and Adelaide have been Order. added to the initial roll-out list. Order. But, Mr President, what I don't understand, what I don't understand is why Order. those opposite don't support that. Order. Why don't they support Townsville and Hobart Senator and Darwin Payne. and Adelaide, I have Mr Senator President. Wong on a point of order. Order. I'll call Senator Wong when I can hear her point of order. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Point of order direct relevance. You, you have just made a ruling 
that assignation of motive is not, does not meet the direct relevance rule, and then the minister immediately goes to assigning motive. I'd ask you to pull it into order. Senator Payne on the point of order. On the point of order, Mr President, what I said immediately after your ruling was, after further consultation with the airlines, industry and advice from Austrade, Townsville, Hobart, yeah, Darwin okay, and Adelaide Senator have Payne, been I, added I, to the initial I, I, rollout list. I, I'm very happy to keep saying of, that, I'll Mr rule, President. Um, on the point of order, Senator Watt, I'm, I'm trying to rule on your leader's point of order. The move from relevance to direct relevance has always been interpreted to contain the nature of an answer. Now, when ministers answer a question, further material that is provided, in my view, still needs to be directly relevant and to meet that test. I can't instruct a minister to accept the premise of a question, however, so the minister can answer it in the terms that a minister deems fit. But it isn't appropriate to assign a motive to, the, to, to a person asking the question. Senator Payne, concluded your answer. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. After being dumped from the list, Darwin was re-added within hours, while Hobart and Townsville took three days to be re-announced. Was Senator McMahon more convincing in her arguments, or did Senators Abetz and Canavan just take longer to complain to the Prime Minister? Order. 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 I'll call Senator Payne when I can hear her answer. Order. I, across the chamber. Senator Watt. Senator Payne. Mr President, uh, I've been very clear to the Chamber uh, in relation to the addition of routes. I have also said the Prime Minister has indicated this is an initial list of destinations and more routes will be added. I indicated that further consultation with airlines, with industry and advice from Austrade uh, enabled Townsville, Hobart, Darwin and Adelaide to be added to the initial rollout list. Mr President, what I would also say is those senators to which Senator Chisholm referred on this side are superb advocates for their communities, superb advocates for their states and their region. And, Mr President, I deafness of uh, crickets Order. on the other side in terms of their own advocacy. Order. Sorry? Order. I'll, Senator, can we have silence so I may call Senator Roberts? Senator Roberts. Senator, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Immigration, Senator Cash, and relates to net migration, which is the difference between the number of arrivals each year and the number of people leaving. In the October budget, the figure for net migration in 2021, 2020 to 2021, was negative 71,600. The budget made the statement that permanent migration will not resume until the second half of 2021. Minister, are these two statements still accurate? The Minister representing the Minister for Immigration, Citizenship, Migrant Services and Multicultural Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Roberts uh, for his question. And Senator Roberts, uh, you would be aware uh, that, in fact, it is now 12 months uh, since we had to close the international borders uh, due to COVID-19. As a result, uh, there is no doubt that immigration to Australia has been impacted. Uh, this has had a number of effects, as you know. The government is completely aware of this, and uh, I know that I have discussed this with you previously. Uh, we are doing everything that we can uh, to keep Australians safe, and in particular, in relation to the rollout of the vaccine. Uh, but from our perspective, um, immigration, as you know, at this point in time has been stopped as a result of COVID-19. Our priority as a government is to keep Australians safe, and that is exactly what we are doing. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. The Immigration Minister's Office receives passenger manifests online daily. The Australian Bureau of Statistics data for data for settler arrivals has not been updated for 2021 data. I asked the Minister for Home Affairs for updated information on the 16th of February, and this information has not yet been provided. Minister, how many settler arrivals and how many other arrivals have occurred nationally in 2021 to date? Order. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President and Senator Roberts. In relation to the exact figures, you did mention the Minister for Home Affairs. I would need to seek those figures from the Minister for Home Affairs. I don't represent uh, the Minister for Home Affairs. What I can confirm, though, is the 2020-21 migration program, as I said to you in relation to uh, 
the answer I provided to your first question is the migration program has had to be shaped and has had to be adapted uh, to changing circumstances and to support Australia's economic and health recovery from COVID-19. Um, I think you would accept that that is a fact. In terms of the migration program ceiling for 2020-2021, uh, it has been retained at 160,000 places uh, to maximise flexibility for program delivery. In relation to those places, what I can advise you, though, is this. 79,600 places were allocated for the skills stream. 77,300 places were allocated for the family stream. 100 places were allocated for the special eligibility stream. Senator and 3,000 places for the has child. Expired. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. Thank you. In the last three days, Sydney Airport processed 50 international passenger flight arrivals. Each day, Australia receives more than 10 overseas passenger flights. Arrivals and returns are broadly equal, so there can be no talk of empty planes. Now, my office is fielding a question over and over again, so I ask that question. Minister, who specifically is on these planes? Students, temporary workers, refugees, partner arrivals for migrants already here, other categories? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you. And again, Senator Roberts, you actually have um, asked a question that should be more appropriately directed to the minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs. So in relation to that, uh, I will take uh, the, the question um, on notice for you and provide you with uh, what advice I can. Uh, but as you know, and I think as um, the Prime Minister and uh, the Minister himself uh, for Home Affairs, uh, Minister Dutton, have been very, very clear in. Our priority is to get as many Australians home as possible. Uh, that continues to be our priority. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the fabulous Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison-McCormack government is continuing to support a new generation of skills reform through the extension of the Boosting Apprenticeships Commencements Wage Subsidy? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I do thank um, our great Senator from the Northern Territory for her question. Uh, and Mr President, I am pleased to advise the Senate that last week the Prime Minister and I announced that the Morrison government would be turbocharging our commitment to create new apprenticeships in Australia. And Senator Wong, actually, the word turbocharging is exactly uh, what we are doing. And that is because last year in October we announced that the government would create 100,000 new apprenticeships and traineeships through our Boosting Apprentice and Commencement Wage Subsidy. It provides, Mr President, 50 per cent um, of uh, the apprentice's wage uh, to the business that takes on the new apprentice. The program has been incredibly successful. and I would like to thank all of the employers out there, because it is the employers who have provided opportunities to these apprentices. And we created the 100,000 new commencements, Mr President, in less than five months. 100,000 new commencements, apprentices and trainees in less than five months. And Mr President, as a result of this, we announced that we are now uncapping the program. Any business that now takes on a new apprentice or trainee up until the 30th of September 2021 will receive the 50 per cent wage subsidy for a full 12 months. Mr President, we've seen the creation of over now 100,000 new apprenticeships and traineeships within that five-month period. And what we now want to see is the creation of tens of thousands of more. Mr President, this is all part of the skills-led recovery um, getting us out of COVID-19. This is about backing opportunities for Australians, uh, particularly young Australians, but also helping Australian businesses get the workers with the skills that they need. And this, of course, is, I said, thanks to the fantastic employers out there around 40,000 of them who have put their hand up and have taken on a new Order. apprentice or trainee into their business. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister explain to the Senate how this builds on essential support being provided to keep Australian apprentices on the tools and in work through the COVID-19 pandemic? 
Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr. President, uh, Senator McMahon is right. It does exactly do that. It builds on measures that we've already got in place. And of course, the first measure that we put in place was our supporting apprentices and trainees uh, wage subsidy. That has now kept around 122,000 apprentices and trainees in work in around 60,000 small and medium businesses across Australia. And these, of course, would be apprentices and trainees that, but for this government's support, would have been let go. Because the first people to be let go during a pandemic, COVID-19, are, of course, apprentices and trainees. In relation to the Building Apprenticeships Commencement Wage Subsidy, I can advise that the initiative has so far supported the creation of over 8,000 bricklayers, 6,000 electricians and almost 11,000 people in retail and hospitality work. They are people that, but for the wage subsidy, may not have been taken on. But employers, because of the wage subsidy, have been able to put up their hand and take on that Order. new apprentice Senator or trainee Cash, time for into the their business. has expired. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline how these investments are continuing to support Australia's economic prosperity into the future? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, the Morrison government is providing record levels of funding to our vocational education and training sector to rebuild our economy, but to also prepare for the future. This includes the boosting apprenticeships wage subsidy, as I've talked about, the supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy, and the $1 billion job trainer fund. And that was, of course, the $1 billion fund that we put together with the states and territories to create around 320,000 additional places, that is, new places in the training market that are either free or low fee. Working with the states and territories, all states and territories signed up to the $1 billion fund. Um, and the key to the success of this, of course, was ensuring that those training places were in areas of skills demand. In other words, people are actually training so that they can get a job. Training in areas of demand, that will get them a job. Mr President, we are providing record funding to vocational education and training in Australia because, as the Prime Minister has said, Order. this is a Senator skills-led Cash, recovery. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In 2019, when answering a question on women and the reporting of rape, Mr Morrison said, and I quote, one of the things that often happens with that is they're not believed and their stories are not believed. And it's important that their stories are believed and that they know that if they come forward, their stories will be believed. When deciding whether the Attorney General was a fit and proper person to remain in his role, why did the Prime Minister listen to the Attorney General but not bother to read the alleged victim's own words? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, Mr President, uh, as I said in relation to uh, the response to Senator Waters' questions earlier, uh, we have um, in Australia, with uh, sound uh, legal and other establishments in place, uh, practices and processes that are well established for the handling uh, of allegations. The Prime Minister uh, and his office uh, acted in accordance with advice from law enforcement agencies uh, that, that order, allegations of a criminal order. nature uh, ought to be provided where possible to police at the earliest opportunity, and that is what the Prime Minister's office did. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary um, question. The former Solicitor General, Justin Gleeson, has said the allegations against the Attorney General should have been referred to the Solicitor General. Given John Howard had no issue with twice asking the Solicitor General for advice on allegations against his workplace relations minister, why has the Prime Minister failed to listen to advice and refer the allegations against his Attorney General to the Solicitor General? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, the allegations in question uh, are allegations of uh, and relating to uh, a, an alleged criminal event uh, dating back to 1988. And the Solicitor General uh, or indeed uh, any other individual office holder uh, outside of uh, a court uh, and its legal process uh, is not in a position to be able to determine uh, the veracity of those allegations. That's what we have Order. courts for. 
Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, why won't the Prime Minister establish an independent inquiry into the sexual assault allegations against his Attorney-General, which would listen to the complaint and consider the alleged victim's own words and the testimony, testimony of James Hook and others? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, as I've said in, uh, in a few answers now, uh, we have established legal processes to handle such allegations. As I also said in response to Senator Waters' question earlier, uh, the Attorney General has exercised the same rights as any other Australian in relation uh, to the initiation of defamation proceedings, and I have no doubt that such matters will be heard uh, in a court of law. Uh, in accordance with uh, all of the normal rules of that Order. court of law uh, in the future at some point. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister advise the Senate what the recent announcement by the International Olympic Committee about the 2032 Olympics means for Queensland and the rest of Australia? The Minister for Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. Australians and Queenslanders, in particular, Mr. President, Senator McGrath, are excited by the International Olympic Committee announcing that South East Queensland is the preferred bidder for the 2032 Olympics and Paralympics. This decision means that we are now a step closer to hosting the Olympic and Paralympic Games with the IOC entering into exclusive negotiations with Queensland for the 2032 event. The announcement is a game-changing de development for the bid, which has been long supported by all levels of government. Since the government announced its support for the bid in 2019, we've been working with the Queensland government, the councils of South East Queensland, as well as the Australian Olympic Committee and the Paralympics and Paralympics Australia to put forward the best possible bid for South East Queensland in 2032. Not only will this event uh, etch a new chapter in Australia's sporting history, as it did with Melbourne in 1956 and Sydney 2000, it will also deliver an economic boost for jobs in Queensland, Mr President, and for Australia. Today's announcement, uh, the announcement from the IOC is a positive development, but we still have a lot of work to do. The Australian Government will, over coming weeks and months, continue to work closely and cooperatively with the bid partners during the exclusive negotiation period. Mr President, we want to make sure that we don't miss this golden opportunity for South East Queensland, all of Queensland and, in, in fact, indeed, for all of Australia. Senator McGrath, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister explain how securing the 2032 Olympics will build on the work done by the government to showcase our nation to the world? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Australia has a rich history of hosting world-class international sporting events. The 1956 Melbourne Olympics and the Sydney 2000 were enormously successful and gave significant confidence to our nation. In recent years, Australia has hosted the AFC Asian Cup in 2015, the 2018 Invictus Games, the 2018 Commonwealth Games and the ICC Women's T20 World Cup. Next year, we will host the ICC Men's T20 World Cup, the FIBA Women's Basketball World Cup and the UCI Road Cycling World Championships. In 2023, we will co-host the FIFA Women's World Cup and, the, in 2026, the UCI BMX World Championships. We are also in with a great show of securing the 2027 Rugby World Cup. Senator McGrath, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline what are the next steps in securing the 2032 Olympics for Queensland? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thank you, Senator McGrath, for the question. While the IOC announcement was very welcome news, Mr President, there remains a lot, of, lot more work to be done to secure the 2032 Olympics and Paralympics for Australia and Queensland. The Australian Government is continuing to work with the Queensland Government, 
the South East uh, Council of Mayors, the Australian Olympics Committee and Paralympics Australia. As the exclusive negotiations or targeted dialogue, dialogue with the IOC occurs over the coming weeks and months. The targeted dialogue specifically addresses our capacity to host the 2032 Games and conveys our preferred host status. Only the South East Queensland bid has this status, Mr President. We are very clear and must, that we must continue to work hard outlining our vision for a successful 2032 Olympics so that our bid can be successful when the winning bidders are announced later this year. Senator Walsh. The question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Today, despite repeated attempts by this government to undermine and delegitimise her experience, Ms Higgins spoke to thousands of women at the March for Justice and called for action. Will the Morrison government now stop shifting blame and listen to Ms Higgins? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. And, uh, and Mr President, indeed, uh, the government um, respects very much uh, the statements made by Ms Higgins. Uh, and, uh, and can I say that I appreciate the engagement of uh, quite a number of uh, staff representatives and former staff in relation to the establishment of the independent uh, review that the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, uh, Ms Kate Jenkins, is undertaking on behalf of the parliament in relation to parliamentary workplaces and the input um, made both publicly and privately uh, of some of those former staff as well as current staff into the terms of reference and the nature and the conduct of that review uh, is greatly valued. Uh, and I now hope that, uh, that the uh, manner in which that review has been stood up uh, can provide confidence uh, to individuals to participate fully in the review process and to share their experiences as the terms of reference invites them to do so uh, and to work with Ms Jenkins uh, as she independently uh, assesses recommendations that can be brought forward uh, to uh, the government and this parliament in terms of action to be taken. Uh, we have also, uh, as an interim measure, uh, put in place uh, a new hotline uh, to uh, handle critical incidents and, uh, and provided details to uh, parliamentary staff, uh, both current and former, uh, in terms of their ability to use uh, that service and to reach out to that service, uh, which has um, uh, staff uh, who are equipped to handle uh, trauma counselling type matters, uh, who have been trained and advised in relation uh, to the referral services that are available, uh, such that uh, they can assist in referral be they of criminal matters through appropriate pathways with appropriate support, or be they of uh, harassment, workplace bullying or other matters uh, which can be referred again appropriately through uh, for investigation and, uh, and assessment again with appropriate support. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Today Ms Higgins spoke of watching the people she had dedicated her life to deny and downplay her experience in question time. The Minister for Women, Senator Payne, has said that, and I quote, the only way it will change is if we as parliamentarians own the problems, own the failings and make the necessary changes. And she repeated those comments today. Exactly when will the Morrison government listen to Australian women and own its failings? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, indeed, uh, we do, as Senator Payne has rightly said, uh, both in her um, International Women's Day address but also in question time today, uh, need to acknowledge that we all have a responsibility in relation to uh, the many issues that have been raised uh, over recent uh, weeks in particular. We have a responsibility to ensure that this place sets an example for the nation in terms of the type of workplace practices uh, that are here workplace practices that need to uh, ensure as far as possible that we stamp out instances of bullying, sexual harassment or sexual assault, that we provide appropriate support services and investigatory services and support where such instances continue, and that we set example in all of those processes, procedures and practices uh, for others to follow. That's the type of work that I'm committed to, uh, to supporting, uh, and I trust that Ms Jenkins, in the review she's undertaking, will deliver recommendations that assist us in that regard.
Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. The Morrison government didn't listen to Ms Higgins when she needed support after the alleged rape, didn't listen when she went public with her experience, instead calling her a lying cow, and even today refused to listen when she spoke at their very doorstep. Why is the Morrison government refusing to listen to the voices of Australian women calling for justice? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, uh, we certainly are committed to supporting uh, Ms. Higgins and cooperating and assisting with uh, the police investigation that is underway uh, as extensively and fully as we possibly can. Uh, the government has always been willing uh, to cooperate and assist in relation to those investigations. We are also determined to uh, continue our work in relation. Uh, to the broader issues, not just those in the parliament that I've referenced in the previous two answers, uh, but those more generally uh, across the community. Uh, I was asked earlier about the Respect at Work uh, report, and we are implementing the first nine recommendations of that report. Uh, many others uh, that uh, apply to the private sector, we are working uh, with the private sector in relation to aspects of that. Uh, we are pursuing uh, implementation of those around training resources. Uh, we are seeking to make sure uh, the portal with information for employers and employees on how to eliminate uh, and deal with sexual harassment uh, and the establishment of the Respect at Work Council that I referenced before. Order, we Senator are Birmingham. committed to working on Time all of these the issues. Expired. Senator Birmingham. And I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Kitching. Oh, I beg your pardon, Senator Kitching, if you wouldn't mind resuming your seat. I've got Senator Seselja on his feet. Yeah, just a moment, Senator Seselja. I don't, I'm not sure your microphone's working, but we'll just try again. Yep. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was a question on uh, the 25th of February from Senator Roberts. Uh, so, additional information is the Western Australian Government manages the WA electricity market, and while it is not connected to the national electricity market, ensuring all Australians have affordable, reliable power is a priority for this government. The Morrison government is focused on delivering policies that ensure that Australian families and businesses have access to the affordable, reliable power that they rely on. We want to ensure that there is a balance in the system, and that includes a range of technologies. Batteries have a role to play alongside other technologies like pumped hydro, coal and, of course, gas. Thank you, Minister. As Senator Kitching. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Understanding Order 745A, I rise to seek an explanation from the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. The unanswered portfolio questions number, numbers are as follows. 2026, 2027, 2029, 2030, 2031, 2045, 2051, 2052, 2053, 2055, 2059, 2065, 2066, 2072, 2077, 2078, 2272, 2357, 2358, 2426, 2427, and at long last, Madam Deputy President, 2972. These questions have been, remained unanswered for some time. And it's not just the problem of not answering those questions or not providing responses to those questions on notice. There's a larger problem for the Prime Minister and for his government. Clause 74 of the Senate Standing Orders provide that a minister has 30 days in which to provide an answer to a question. As at midday today, the 15th of March 2021, there are 22 overdue questions on notice lodged via the table office, and the oldest, oldest of those is 151 days overdue. As an ardent question on Senator notice lodger, Kitching, if I just might remind you, you've listed the questions that remain unanswered, and then I think we seek a response from the minister, and then you can take note of that response. I'm happy to seek a response. Thank, thank you. you, Minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, Deputy President. Uh, thanks, Senator Kitching. I will be brief in my response. Um, uh, I uh, 
Now, I understand, and I thank Senator Kitching for uh, some uh, advance notice in line with the, uh, the traditional courtesies on these matters. Uh, I understand the questions uh, relate to uh, questions in the Prime Minister's portfolio. Um, I, uh, I have, uh, in the short time since uh, advice, uh, sought to raise these issues with the Prime Minister's office, uh, and together we will enable to have them tabled as soon as possible. Thank you, Minister. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Deputy President. As at midday today, the 15th of March 2021, there are 22 overdue questions on notice lodged via the table office. The oldest is 151. And, uh, Senator Kitching, I note that you're moving to take note of the I'm minister's a, I response. I am moving to take notice of the minister's response. Thank you. Thank you. And I thank the minister for um, his explanation. And I do hope that given the oldest of these is 151 days overdue, the Prime Minister's office might seek see a way forward in responding as promptly as possible, given they've had so much time. Um, as an ardent question on notice lodger, um, both because I believe in the principle of government accountability and because I believe this government in particular is quite an unaccountable government in the history of governments of the Commonwealth. Yet this is one of the most flagrant disregards of, for the Senate and its standing orders that I have ever seen. And remember, we are all bound by those standing orders, except it appears the Prime Minister's office. Um, the Prime Minister is meant to lead by example, an example that flows down to his ministers and his backbench. But this is more than five times overdue the mandated time frame set by this chamber for the return of answers. There's a clear pattern of disrespect and a lack of transparency and accountability by the Prime Minister and by extension the Minister representing him in this place, Senator Birmingham. Beyond just my questions on notice, there are presently nine freedom of information requests from, the F from FOIs lodged with the Prime Minister's office, under review with the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. All nine FOIs, FOI requests were refused by the Prime Minister's office. And this is an extract from a recent Office of the Australian Information Commissioner email that they sent to me. As set out below, the OAIC continues to experience a year-upon-year -year increase in the number of Information Commissioner's review applications received. The OAIC's annual report 2019-2020 indicates that there has been a focus on resolving matters which are over 12 months old. While the OAIC continues to face resourcing challenges in the FOI area, we implemented further process improvements and resolved more IC reviews during the reporting period than ever before. We achieved a 26% improvement, resolving 829 IC reviews in 2019-2020. The significant increase in the number of applications after sustained increases in previous years, along with our focus on reducing the number of cases over 12 months old, meant we finalised 72 per cent of IC reviews within 12 months, short of our target of 80 per cent. As stated in the annual report, the OIAC continues to face challenges in the FOI area. The OAIC continues to see an increase in the number of new applications lodged, which in turn impacts on the ability to finalise existing reviews. The percentage of matters finalised relates to all matters on hand, and includes those finalised through our intake and early resolution processes. These processes often result in matters being withdrawn or closed on the basis of jurisdictional issues. As noted in the annual report, the OAIC received 1,066 IC review applications last financial year. We remain committed to finalising all IC review as quickly as possible. In doing so, we have been focused on resolving the oldest matters first. As you can see from the extract of that letter uh, from the Information Commissioner to me that I've just read out, the OAIC, which is an independent umpire, is clearly starved for funding. And this would appear to be a deliberate move by the Morrison government to avoid accountability, and I think that is a great shame. As some of you may know, and Madam Deputy President, you may know as well, that there's been a gold standard set in this building for constant evasion and masterly obfuscation by the Department of Parliamentary Services. But as someone who has entered, I hate, almost hate to say this, over 11,000 questions on notice over the life of this parliament alone, I have never seen a question on notice 151 days overdue. So what can you do in 151 days? Well, if you're in Victoria, you can have a lockdown in a quarter. 
You can also, in 151 days, you can get more than halfway to Mars. You can walk nearly a third of the way along the Great Wall of China and you can easily walk from Melbourne to Cairns. That's what you can do in 151 days, except if you're the Prime Minister's office, who doesn't respond to questions on notice within the time frame that most other departments and agencies, most other portfolio ministers manage to be able to do. This is disrespectful to the people, the Australian people who are paying all of our salaries. They're paying the salaries of the people in the departments and agencies, and they're paying the, the salaries of the people in the Prime Minister's office and these same people are going to put, you know, what we've seen is a well before coronavirus, a half a trillion dollars in debt. All the Australian people are going to be paying for that debt for a long, long, long time, as will their children and probably their grandchildren as well. But what we would ask is that the Prime Minister and his office respond to questions on notice. They do not get to remove themselves from this process. And I would like them to answer those questions on notice. You know, Australia is one of the oldest democracies in the world. So we just don't deserve a culture where there is a lack of transparency, lest we believe that the old ad adage, and I hate to say that this might actually be true, that the people who keep the most secrets have the most to hide. So I would like those questions on notice answered. I'd also like the FOIs dealt with as well, but, you know, we one step at a time. This is a Prime Minister and a government that is not transparent about how it spends public money. This is a Prime Minister and a government that kept secrets about its plan to sack a quarter of this country's posties under the cover of a global health pandemic. But perhaps the biggest, deepest and darkest secret of this government is, keeping, is that that is keeping the member for Chisholm in the other place as a national security threat. Some here might, be, uh, might know of the federal court documents that our own domestic security agency, ASIO, had made an adverse security assessment of H. Wei Feng, known as Ha Ha Lu. No relation to the member for Chisholm, though they are close because he has actually donated money. If not for its serious security implications, we would put this story in the truly bizarre pile. An ex-Chinese PLA soldier turned businessman, nicknamed Ha Ha, doesn't speak English yet somehow becomes a go-to community representative and party donor for conservatives in this country. It almost reads like a John le Carre spy novel. Except when it comes to ha-ha, the joke's really on all of us. Some members of the government have actually risked national security by courting donations from this man. And in the case of the member for Chisholm, this just confirms more of what we already know. The member for Chisholm hasn't been disendorsed, but that's partly because of factional issues in Victoria. But what I would say that that's the, uh, the deepest, darkest secret of this government. Because what happens when people don't respond, when the government isn't transparent, that's when you start to get people overriding the standing orders of this place. And that, and that actually is, leads to bigger and darker problems for a government. All Australians deserve transparency from their government and accountability. Beyond unanswered questions on notice, what the Senate seeks here today is an answer to the following question above all. What exactly is this government trying to hide? Most of those who sit opposite were pre-selected on a mantra of small government that should not be running interference for those who seek to obfuscate and evade parliamentary scrutiny by refusing to answer questions on notice put to them by the Australian Parliament. And I would say that everyone opposite, when they were pre-selected, did face questions like that. But what we've actually seen is that they actually don't believe in what they tell their pre-selectors. I would like I'm going to go through now some of these questions on notice that seem so difficult to answer. Um, can details be provided of all incoming guests of government visits, including costs in 2018-2019 and 2019-2020? Now, not a very difficult question. Please list the number of Freedom of Information Act requests received by the department for the following years. 2019-2020 financial year and 2020-2021 financial year to date. For each year above, please provide the number of FOI requests the department granted in full, the number of FOI requests the, the department granted in part, the number of FOI requests the department refused in full and the number of FOI requests the department refused for practical reasons under the Freedom of Information Act. 
For each year above, please also provide the number of times a department failed to make any decision on an FOI request within the 30-day statutory period. Now, they must be very aware when they haven't met the timeline requirements. So I wouldn't have thought that was a hard question. And the number of times a request to the department resulted in a practical refusal, that is, no decision was made on the request. For each year above, please also provide the number of times the department's FOI decisions have been appealed to the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner and the number of times has the OAIC overturned in whole or in part the department's decision to refuse access to material. I mean, I could, these are very simple requests that have essentially are uh, in a database but can't seem to be found in, remember, nearly half a year. Here's another one. Please provide a list of all members of the deregulation task force advisory panel since its establishment, including the periods of their appointments. One might not have thought that was too difficult. Are members of the deregulation task force advisory panel entitled to any remuneration? If so, please provide a full breakdown of the remuneration to which each member is entitled. Wouldn't have thought that was hard either. Um, with reference to a news article, Australia Post licensees and customers flood PM Scott Morrison with $5 notes. I've asked how many $5 notes have been received in total? How many $5 notes has the Prime Minister's office in Parliament House received? How many $5 notes has the Prime Minister's depart department received? Have any $5 notes been received at other, any other locations? Have any other denominations, including coins, been received? Can a breakdown in total value of, those, of these be provided? Have any notes or coins in any currency other than Australian dollars been received? Can a breakdown be provided? In Australian dollars, what is the total value in the exchange rate of the day on Vansa being provided? What has been done with the money received? And if nothing, what will be done with the money received? Um, this was in relation to, I don't know whether people remember the franchisees, uh, post office franchisees, saying that they would send $5 notes in in order to pay for the purchase of Cartier watches by the former um, managing director of Australia Post. In relation, this is another question, in relation to bonuses, short-term incentives, rewards or gifts, monetary or otherwise, awarded to any executive, employee, officer, contractor or any other person, can the quantum of expenditure be provided for each of the following periods for the portfolio, all departments, agencies, government appointed boards, boards and structures, from 1 July 2019 to 30 June 2020 and 1 July 2020 to 10 December 2020. So as you can see, Deputy President, um, these are not particularly difficult questions. They do That information does reside. A lot of it will reside in databases uh, or other um, you know, Word documents that people keep on their computers. It's just that, really, after 151 days, it seems that the Prime Minister's office cannot be bothered to answer these questions. As I've said before, the Prime Minister should be leading by example. So it is a wonder that we're not having other ministers and other departments and agencies following the Prime Minister's example and actually paying no regard at all to the standing orders of the Senate. Now, I know that there are some ministers in the other place who don't always act respectfully towards the Senate, but one might assume that when one reaches the highest political office in the land, one might be able to follow some of the rules. And it's not like they're short-staffed in there either. So I would like those notes. I would like the minister representing the Prime Minister to take this um, response to his explanation on notice. I still don't really have a response, in fact, as to why it's taken 151 days. I mean, this is it's extraordinary, really. Um, but I'll leave it there, Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Um, if there's no other speakers on that matter, we'll now move to taking note. Senator Kitching. I've got another. Yep. Oh, you've got another one? All right, I'll just put the question on that first one. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Kitching be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Kitching. Thank you. Um, Deputy President, understanding order 745A, I rise to seek an explanation from the minister representing the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme and Government Services, Senator Rustin. Clause 74 of the Senate standing orders provides that a minister has 30 days in which to provide an answer to a question. 
As at midday today, the 15th of March 2021, there were 29 overdue questions on notice lodged via the table office, but I would point out, Deputy President, that at 9am this morning there were 125 outstanding questions on notice, um, but much like a primary school student, Minister Roberts seems to be hurriedly doing his homework. Um, I'll, I don't know whether the minister yeah, so wishes we'll to give respond. The minister, an opportunity to respond, Minister. Thank you very. Are you putting the list of the outstanding questions? <laughs> yeah. Portfolio question numbers are as follows: 2943, 2944, 2945, 2946, 2947, 2948, 2950, 2951, 2952, 2953. 2954, 2955, 2956, 2957, 2958, 2959, 2960, 2961, 2962, 2963, 2964, 2965, 2966, 2967, 2968, 2969, 2970 and 2971. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Minister. Um, thank you very much, um, Madam Deputy President, and thank you, Senator Kitching, um, for your uh, question. Um, across the whole of the social services portfolio, more than 500 um, questions on notice have been lodged for response, and many of them have had, had quite um, complex data and, and analysis requirements. Um, we've also had uh, uh, attended numerous COVID committee hearings and responded to uh, approximately an additional 80 um, questions on notice as a result of attendances to that committee. Um, as part of the response to the COVID committee, um, the department uh, across both portfolio areas um, agreed to provide um, comprehensive fortnightly um, data, data sets to the committee to ensure that uh, we were providing um, information in the most timely possible way to ensure transparency and to ensure that the information um, was available for anybody to be able to see. Um, I, I understand um, that, as a general rule, um, my department is, uh, is regularly on time with questions on notice. Um, however, um, with the COVID environment as it has been over the last 12 months, there has been a significant increase in the amount of information that has been sought from the departments that sit within the social services portfolio. Um, and uh, we uh, obviously are very keen to be able to provide the necessary information to this place and to ministers who ask questions on notice. Um, and so, uh, in requesting that information, we thought the provision of, of fortnightly data sets and the like would, would be of assistance. But, um, Senator, uh, I will certainly take um, the request that you've provided in relation to ensuring that the remainder of the questions that still uh, on notice that are still yet to be unanswered, uh, yet, yet to be answered, um, are answered and tabled um, as soon as possible. Thank you, Minister. Senator Kitching. Deputy President, and thank you, Minister Rustin, for your response. I must say that this department. And are you taking note? I'm taking note of the um, of the minister's response. Uh, I have to say this department is doing better than the Prime Minister's office and the Prime Minister's own department. I mean, they really lead by very poor example. Um, this department isn't anywhere near the Prime Minister's office of uh, being 151 days overdue. Um, these are slightly less than that. Uh, I am going to just refer to the answers that were provided this morning by the minister. Um, some of those, this morning the minister returned a single answer for 98 questions that were overdue. And I'll read you the answer. The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme and Government Services meets with a range of government and community stakeholders on a regular basis. Providing a response to this series of 98 parliamentary questions on notice would be an unreasonable diversion of resources. How can it be an unreasonable diversion of resources, I ask Deputy President, to tell the, the Senate that Minister Robert has actually been doing nothing? Because let me read you an example of one of these 98 questions that were responded to this morning with that, you know, it'd be an unreasonable diversion of resources. My question was, can detail of official duties undertaken by Minister Robert on the 5th of July 2020 be provided? 
But apparently that's an unreasonable diversion of resources. To answer that, I would hope that the minister or his office keeps a diary somewhere, because the reason I'm asking this is a minister claimed travel allowance. So he should want to answer that question, because it would prove that he was actually doing something to claim the travel allowance. I would think he would want to answer every one of those 98 questions and that someone in his office keeps his diary and can tell what he was doing that day, for which he's claimed travel allowance. I'm not, I'll take that interjection, Senator Rustin. I'm not yelling at you, Senator Rustin. You are, the, you are the representing minister here. But if you could convey to Minister Robert that he might like to respond for his own benefit to some of these questions. Now, of course, now while we're on the, the subject of Minister Robert, and I'll keep in mind Standing Order 193, Sub Order 3. Um, the, I mean, really, I mean, I can't really go past robo debt. So let's look at Minister Robin and what he did there to see what a, you know, what a wonderful exemplar of a minister he's been. RoboDebt is not just a failure of this government to provide a strict for Australia's most vulnerable. It is an example of this government's agenda to punish people who need support the most. Now, I think we're a pretty lucky country here and we should share that luck. We should want people. It should not suit more affluent people in a society to want other people to be downtrodden. You don't want great disparity in societies, I think. So robo-debt was an example of really of trying to actually degrade people who actually need support. This was a plan, of course, cooked up by the Prime Minister when he was Social Services Minister and carried on by his former flatmate, Minister Robert. In order to build the illusion of a budget surplus, in 2015, the then Social Services Minister and now Prime Minister, the member for Cook, put together a plan to raise unlawful debts using a Centrelink robot that calculated debts using unreliable averaged ATO data. It wrought terrible destruction through some of the community's most vulnerable. Over 2,000 people died after receiving a robo-debt notice. Thousands more dealt with the stress of debt collectors and shame at wrongly being called a thief. $1.2 billion of taxpayers' money was spent settling this class action. That's $1.2 billion. Oh, okay. The Prime Minister expanded the scheme when he became Treasurer and now refuses to take responsibility with the RoboDebt Royal Commission. The government ignored at least, if not more, 70 AAT decisions spelling out RoboDebt's illegality. In November 2019, the government admitted it was unlawful and paused the scheme. Even then, they continued to fight robo-debt appeals at the AAT. Nothing like throwing you know, good money after bad. And they've failed to deliver on their promise to refund victims of the scheme with 3,000 dead people's estates still owed robo-debt refunds. As the minister responsible for the NDIS, the member for Fadden has also overseen widespread neglect and misery. The National Disability Insurance Scheme is a vital national service. But after seven years of this government, it has been slashed and mismanaged to such an extent that people are now dying of neglect in their homes. In early 2020, it was revealed that 1,200 Australians with, dis with a disability had died over three years while waiting to be funded for the scheme. So you imagine you're a person with a disability, you hear of this scheme, you think that this is, this is something the government is going to do to help you. And yet, you, you are 1,200 Australians with a disability died before they could be funded by this scheme that was brought in to supposedly help them. Minister Robert denied anyone had died waiting, even though this was cold, hard data provided by the National Disability Insurance Agency. Since then, Reports have emerged of NDIS participants who have died due to a failure of the government to properly oversee the scheme and the providers that deliver its services. One of these people, one of these Australians, was Anne-Marie Smith. Anne-Marie Smith was a 54-year-old Adelaide NDIS participant who died on April the 6th of severe septic shock, multi-organ failure, severe pressure sores, malnutrition, and issues connected with her cerebral palsy after being confined to a cane chair 24 hours a day for more than a year. Imagine sitting in a cane chair for 24 hours a day 
for more than a year. Just pause and imagine that. Anne-Marie Smith's NDIS package included six hours of support per day. Reports are that she only received two hours of care per day and had not been outside her house in years. How could she? She was in her cane chair 24 hours a day. Anne-Marie's terrible demise is nothing short of a tragedy. She should be alive and thriving. Instead, she was neglected, abandoned and has died in the most terrible and degrading circumstances. Amory Smith died after years of neglect on April the 6th, 2020. A year on, a year on, and the government still hasn't taken any tangible steps to stop this from happening again. Another victim of this government and of Minister Roberts' neglect is David Harris. NDIS participant David Harris was dead in his Parramatta unit for two months before his body was discovered by police. Two months. After he was found by authorities, his grieving sister, who's based interstate, learned David's NDIS funding had been cut off because he missed an annual review meeting. This meant cleaners and other NDIS funded supports stopped visiting the 55 year old who was schizophrenic, diabetic, incontinent and needing regular injections. How many Australians with a disability must die in their homes before Minister Robert admits that there is a problem? The minister and his office have also been briefing out to a journalist that he will become Australia's next Home Affairs Minister. That is what his office is briefing out to journalists upstairs. Now what he really should do is concentrate on the portfolio he has now and fix the problems in this system. No one wants another Anne-Marie Smith. No one wants another David Harris. Yet I bet, as, we, as I stand here talking now today, I bet there's another Anne-Marie Smith. I bet there's another David Harris out there who, because of some bureaucratic bungling, is not receiving the support they need, even though they may well be an NDIS participant. You know, there are certain things that people say that aren't great about the Gold Coast, but I'm afraid that Minister Robert probably exemplifies some of those more, you know, terrible characteristics of the Gold Coast. You know, I... Order. <laughs> white shoe brigade. A white shoe brigade. And like any grifter, Minister Robert wants to move on to his next victim, which seems to be the Department of Home Affairs. He'd really, like to, he'd really like to actually move on to defence, is what I hear, where he'd be given the opportunity to grift with defence contractors, but I'm sure the Prime Minister is willing to put him in charge at some point. But for people that rely on some level of support provided by our social welfare system and those living with a disability who just want a life of dignity, like any other Australian, Minister Robert cannot, in good conscience, be left where he is. Now, I'm going to read out some of the questions on notice that I put in and the Chamber can judge for itself whether these are really difficult questions or notice that could have been answered some time ago uh, within the 30 days of, as provided by the standing orders, or whether there's some excuse for, Senator, to, for Minister Robert to be uh, actually taking more time into making these questions on notice delayed. So there are in the 2017-2018 financial year, how many new national disability insurance scheme providers were registered? This is not a hard question. With reference to the figure to be provided to question A above, how many new NDIS providers were registered within 30 days of lodgement? So obviously this is to see whether there is efficiency in the department. With reference to the figure to be provided to question A above, how many new NDIS providers were registered within 30 days of lodgement without additional information or documents being requested from an applicant? With reference to the figure to be provided to question A above, how many new NDIS providers were registered within 60 days of lodgement? Now, I'm not going to read through, so it goes 60 days, then I wanted to know 90 days, 120 days, 150 days, 200 days, 250 days, and 300 days. But if, if a provider, if an NDIS provider was registered over 300 days, it took 300 days to lodge a new NDIS provider, as we understand it. I wanted to know how many of those there were. Now, I've asked up to 
how many new NDIS providers were registered within 400 days of lodgement without additional information or documents being requested from an applicant. Because my understanding is that the longer it obviously takes for an NDIS provider to be registered, that means that there are people in the community who should be on the NDIS, cannot actually get to an NDIS provider. That's why we want this information. I asked that for 2018-2019, for 2020 to July 2020 to 31 December 2020, um, as at um, the 5th of February as well. These are not difficult questions, Deputy President. These are questions that are in a database that the department will hold. I want these, an these questions answered. So, for example, can a current organisational chart for the National Disability Insurance Scheme Quality and Safeguards Commission be provided? Apparently that takes longer than 30 days to find an org chart. That's what I'm after, an org chart. And it took, it's still don't have an answer to that. And I have no idea how long this is going to take to get an org chart. It's a secret org chart. I'll take Senator Wong's interjection. It's a secret org chart. I would also like to know the information on historical statuses of registered providers and dates of registration. Um, but apparently this is, apparently that's also a very difficult question. Um, and apparently, apparently some of this information isn't available. I mean, I'm happy to share with Senator Rustin, Deputy President, I'm happy to share this. There is a reason I'm asking for this, and that's to understand what the NDIS is providing, where are the gaps for people in the community who should be on the NDIS. That's why I'm asking these questions. It's not out of idle curiosity. Um, I would like these questions responded to. Uh, I it is over the 30 days as provided by the standing orders. But I would really appreciate if Senator Rustin could speak with Minister, Rust Minister Robert and ask him to respond as quickly as he is able. I take Senator Rustin's point that, of course, there have been, during COVID and um, in providing information regularly through that period, uh, there have obviously the departments have been busy. I'm a reasonable person, but I do expect these questions to be answered. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kitching. If there's no other people, senators wishing to make a contribution on that matter, I shall now ask if there are. Uh, oh, I'll put the questions. Beg your pardon, Senator Kitching. So the question is: the motion is moved by Senator Kitching be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So we now move to taking note. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Deputy President. Well, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Payne and Birmingham to the questions asked by Senators Wong, Gallagher and Walsh. Today, more than 100,000 women and men have attended rallies in 36 different locations across the country. Now, my mum was one of them. She attended a march in Lismore. My mum has been waiting for a long time. She sang along to Helen Reddy's anthem, I Am Woman, in the 70s. And I won't say that I didn't tear up a little to arrive at the march down on the lawns here and hear that song being played and realise how long so many Australian women have waited for equality, have waited to be heard. Because women of all generations are tired of not being listened to. They are frustrated that after decades of fighting for equality, we are still facing the same problems. We are still hearing the same stories again and again. We have had enough of sexism. We have had enough of sexual harassment. We have had enough of violence against women and their children. We have enough of sexual assault and we have had enough of rape. We have had enough of not being safe or valued in our workplaces. We've had enough of inequality and discrimination. And women today are saying that we will no longer be silent and we will no longer be silenced. One in five women over the age of 15 has experienced sexual assault. Over the last five years, 40% of women have experienced sexual harassment at work. Ms Brittany Higgins appeared today and gave a brave speech to a crowd that wanted to hear her voice. 
And she said, to see real progress, we must seek it out. And she made the point that time is on the side of perpetrators because the status quo is the friend of the perpetrators. And while there is no action, while there is no progress, while there is no urgency and no ambition, there are no costs and no consequences to the perpetrators all across Australian workplaces. And the frustration and the anger that so many Australian women are feeling right now is because we have been fighting for equality and for respect for a very long time. And it would be good to know that there is a government that is listening, a government capable of approaching the task of reform, of change, of progress with ambition and urgency. As a government in its eighth year, there have been plenty of time and plenty of opportunities for this government to take that project on. This is a government that inherited the first ever, the first ever national plan to reduce violence against women and their children, established under Prime Minister Gillard, but a Labor project left languishing for the entire period of this government. When I was appointed to this portfolio, I sought through estimates to find out what's happening with the initiatives in this plan. It took months, months and months and months to get an update. It was unclear who was in charge of the national plan. Was it Senator Rustin? Was it Senator Payne? They didn't seem to know. Certainly no one in the department even had a spreadsheet that could be easily provided to a senator asking questions about implementation of this national document to tackle violence against women and children. There is no urgency. There is no commitment. There appears to be very little interest in these issues from this government universally. And it's not surprising to me that the level of curiosity about the claims being made on government today is so low, so low the Prime Minister and the Minister for Women couldn't even do these marches the courtesy of going down to the lawns and listening with respect, listening to the victims and survivors who once again told their story, talked about what it meant to them to have been silenced but now to speak. I don't understand why the Prime Minister didn't attend that march, and I don't understand why Minister Payne sat in this chamber. I simply don't understand it. But I will say this. Australian women are saying enough is enough and we expect more. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Scar. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, first uh, I acknowledge uh, Senator McAllister's contribution and uh, I uh, it was impossible not to feel the, uh, the passion of her address and also the pride in which she, uh, she had for her mother attending the march in Lismore, and I, uh, I do acknowledge that, acknowledge it deeply. Madam Acting Deputy President, I think we need to be fair to Minister Payne. I was actually in this chamber giving a speech in relation to the bill uh, on academic freedom and freedom of speech, and Minister Payne uh, was actually attending the chamber discharging her duties as a minister of this government. And whilst I have in this place heard reflections cast upon senators for not being in this place at certain times, which is considered disorderly, I must say uh, that this is the first time I've heard uh, reflections being cast on a senator for actually being in this place uh, doing their job. I've known Senator Payne for over 30 years. She is an extraordinarily decent person who cares deeply about these issues. And I think anyone who with a fair and reasonable mind looks at Senator Payne's background, her advocacy on these issues and other issues of great social consequence could not come to a conclusion other than the fact that Senator Payne is extraordinarily sincere and committed to doing what can be done in relation to address addressing the issues raised by Senator McAllister. 
Certainly in the context of budget estimates, I've admired how Senator Payne, wearing her Minister for Women hat, has addressed issues and questions which have been put to her by members from all parties in relation to the discharge of her ministerial responsibilities. And in particular, I congratulate the minister with respect to her dedication to promoting the cause of women across the Pacific region. In relation to the accusation levelled at our Prime Minister that he could not make time to meet the people who convened in their march on this place, I think it's important uh, that we quote what the Prime Minister has said in relation to that matter and that it's on the public record. And to quote the Prime Minister, I haven't had a habit of going out to do any marches when they've come to Canberra, but I'm very happy to receive a delegation and I'll respectfully receive that, as I'm sure they will respectfully engage with me." Close quote. So the reality is the Prime Minister has adopted a course of conduct where he does not engage uh, outside the parliament with marches, whatever the cause, whatever the cause. But he made a sincere, a sincere invitation to a delegation to come and meet with him and also with Senator Payne in relation to the matters of concern. And I think that's a fair and reasonable position for our Prime Minister to adopt. There have been some other comments uh, made during this course, the course of this debate, uh, which I think uh, senators need to carefully reflect upon, certainly in relation uh, to the Attorney-General and the description with respect to the call for independent inquiries into the matters that were the subject of a criminal investigation which has been closed, I think bear extraordinarily, extraordinary close scrutiny. The fact of the matter is, and this is my view and certainly the view of other members of, of my legal profession who I've discussed, it would be extraordinarily problematic to embark on an independent inquiry, the heart of which is going to matters which were the subject of a criminal complaint. That is simply a reality of the situation. It is problematic. And I think those opposite should at least acknowledge the fact that these are extraordinarily difficult issues and that there is a legitimate view that in an independent inquiry into matters which have been the subject of a criminal investigation which has closed, especially when the allegations are more than three decades old, is a difficult proposition. And that certainly has been argued by such eminent lawyers as Arthur Moses SC, who was president of the New South Wales Bar Council and also the Australian Law Council. Thank you, Senator, ah, Senator O'Neill. My heart is fairly beating out of my chest at this point of time. I've got four minutes and 52 seconds to make some comments about what's going on here today. And I can tell you it is nowhere near enough time to put on the record the disgrace of what has happened in this parliament and what has happened around this country for far too long. There were questions asked today, and I accept that Senator Scar is doing his job of trying to defend his government, but it is hard to accept when you defend the indefensible. Today we heard from Minister Payne, who should be standing up for women, who should be standing up with women today outside this parliament, thousands and thousands of us across the country, with good men standing up and saying, enough is enough. It's time for change. And instead, she chose to be in here instead of with the Australian people. That is an indication of how out of touch this government is with the reality of what's happening to women. I've been in this chamber and I've spoken about sexual harassment that's going on in businesses across this country. I spoke for AMP Annie, whose voice was robbed of her. Well, we're sick and tired of our voices being taken by people and silenced in the, in the platitudinous words that we heard today from those who dared to stand and say, we didn't go outside because they didn't want to meet us on our terms. That's what the government said today. That's what Senator Payne said. That's what the Prime Minister said. They would not meet me on my terms inside this place where I have overseen rape. They won't acknowledge that adequately. 
and today they showed that they are not up for the change that is needed to rid us of this cancer. This cancer in this building and across this nation. Today when Michelle O'Neill commenced her speech, a fine Australian unionist, a union, a very, very powerful part of democracy, led by two remarkable women. When Michelle O'Neill stood up and spoke about the pad foot, the sound of men's feet approaching as a young girl lies under the covers, I'm reminded of what it was like when I was at a party and I was 10 years old. And I heard that sound. And I thank God I had enough education for my parents to be aware of it and get up and get out of the way of sexual assault as a 10-year-old. And let me tell you what's gone on for me in the last few weeks. Like all these women across the country, I thought I'd packaged up a lot of the rubbish that I've had to take in from men. I thought I'd put a lot of it away in the boxes where I leave it littered behind me. I thought it was gone, but so much of it's come up. So much of it has come up. And this is what's happening to women across this country. It is a deep, wild and angry rage. I've had men in this parliament, parliamentarians, yell out at me as I'm walking along the corridor, hey, sexy legs, how's it going? When did that, when did that get sanctioned? When is that OK? It's never OK, Senator Scar, and you're right. And there are decent men, but there are too many who are not decent. And there are too many leading this government, both men and women, who are in the business of shutting this thing down, of silencing women. Well, we will not be silenced. I've got one minute and 24 seconds. Do you want to hear more about what it's like from the age of 12 or 13 when your breasts start to grow, to have men want to grope you? Do you want to hear what it's like to be in a, a workplace? where because you're a woman, you're fair game for any comment any day, where you learn to laugh it off with the blokes because that's the only way that you're considered tough enough for an Australian workplace, well, that is not good enough. It is not good enough. I will not stand for it. Women of Australia will not stand for this any longer. It's got to be done. And I can hear from the very quiet, careful and controlled comments from Senator Birmingham that this government is going to hide behind those words, due process, procedures, strategies, planning. Well, we've heard all that before. We've heard it over and over and over, and it's not enough. It was never enough. It's not going to be enough. It's time for wholesale change. I don't want my daughters to continue to put posts up on the Me Too page about things that break my heart. I'm going to be a grandmother in two weeks, in two, in two months, and I want the child who's born in this next two months to live in a different kind of Australia. But this government is not Thank up you. to the task. Thank you, they Senator are not up to the task. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, uh, Thank you. Madam Deputy President, uh, I start by, uh, I guess, you know, reflecting in the same way that uh, Senator Scar did in, in reflecting on those uh, that have made contributions, Senator McAllister and Senator O'Neill. And uh, you know, join, I suppose, with them in, 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 in recognising the deep importance of addressing these issues in recognising the deep importance of recognising the serious issues that, uh, sadly, too many workplaces in Australia are challenged by. Uh, everyone deserves to be able to come to work and work in a safe environment. Everyone. Everyone. And our national parliament ought to be and should aim to be the model workplace the model workplace, that all other workplaces could actually model themselves off. All political parties, all political parties and those who work in Parliament House have a role to play in ensuring that we achieve this. Now, the government has taken some very significant steps, but sadly we don't seem to get much recognition much, I don't seem to see the recognition of those steps that have been taken. In fact, I, I actually welcome the fact that initially there was some real bipartisanship in, 
in getting on board and making sure that the independent processes that need to be put in place are, are there. Uh, the government has taken significant steps in the last few weeks to address the concerns raised by current and former staff and by parliamentarians. And I'll take you through these. It's why we've established an independent and confidential 24-7 telephone service to support current and former Commonwealth ministerial parliament parliamentary and electorate office staff and those who have experienced serious incidents in any Commonwealth parliamentary workplace. It's why this government has announced an independent review into the Commonwealth parliamentary uh, uh, workplaces, which will be led by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Ms. Case, Ms. Kate Jenkins. Also, uh, Stephanie Foster, the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, now, Stephanie, I don't know her personally, but I sit on the, uh, the, 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 the Finance and Public Administration Committee and I, she often uh, presents in front of estimates and we know, uh, having sat through that and watching her and how she conducts herself, a thoroughly independent person, a very professional person, someone that is going to, uh, no doubt, uh, I'm confident, will do an outstanding job uh, in the work that she's been tasked to do, which is to assist and advise the Prime Minister on how to improve the processes that are necessary to support people, in particular staff, when serious matters arise. Everyone has the right to protest. Everyone has the right to process and raise their voice. And these are serious issues and the whole parliament is working through the response to the concerns that have been raised. And I recognise the importance of uh, the, the, the stated aims of those that marched uh, on the footsteps of Parliament House today out there on the lawn. Uh, and I would encourage those that were part of that and the organisers of that to please take up the offer that was provided by the Prime Minister in good faith to sit down and listen and, and, and so, that, so, that, so he can hear from them and so that there can be a genuine discussion, a genuine discussion that could take place. That's what's needed here. That's what's needed. I welcome and exercise the free speech of those that were outside. Uh, and it's appropriate that we, that we engage with these issues. Uh, just like we had the uh, prior to question time, the, 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 the debating the bill around freedom of speech on campus. Now, the, the freedom to be able to express and deal with issues and be able to deal with them in a, in a free and, and appropriate way is, is of course very important. We will continue to work with those opposite and anyone in this place uh, to proceed with this independent review into the issues that both uh, Ms Higgins uh, has, has claimed uh, has happened uh, and, the culture in the, and also the culture in this workplace. And I hope that this issue doesn't continue to be politicised. It would be disappointing, but the risks are present when those opposite seem to exploit the trauma that's been caused. And we've got to focus on what is necessary to move forward. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Walsh. Well, when the government became aware of the assault of Brittany Higgins in this place two years ago, they had one job, and that was to listen. To listen to her and to help her speak out. When the story of the assault on Brittany Higgins broke just a few weeks ago, the government still had one job to listen and to help her speak out. When the story of the allegations against the Attorney-General broke, the government again had one job, to listen to the story of the woman we now know was called Kate and to hear her story. In the era of Grace Tame, who had to launch a campaign called Let Her Speak to be heard, in the era when one in five women in this country will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime, in the era when that figure is so much worse for women of colour, in the era when one woman a week is murdered by a man she knows, in this era when sexual violence against women is at epidemic proportions, the government has one job, to listen and by listening to send a powerful message to all victim survivors of sexual assault, to tell them that they too will be heard, 
to tell women around the country that their voice will be respected, that they will be believed, to tell the women of Australia their government gets it, to tell them their government understands, understands the shared experience of every woman, whether that experience is the relentless comments, the looks, the words being spoken over when you have something to say, or whether it's the abuse, the violence, the sexual assault, the murder. The government has had just one job in all of this, and that is to listen. To listen to women and let them know that their own government has their backs. And it is because this government has refused to listen that the women of Australia have taken to the streets today, all around the country, because instead of listening, what this government has done on every occasion is instead to roll out its political machine, roll out its machine to silence women from speaking up. This is what Brittany Higgins says she was faced with two years ago, a political machine that made her choose between speaking out and keeping her job. And this year, when she found her voice, the government moved to discredit her. The Prime Minister himself used victim-blaming language, drawing attention to what he called the vulnerable position she found herself in. Instead of taking aim at the alleged perpetrator and sending a message to perpetrators that it is they who will be held to account for raping women, not women who will be held to account for speaking out. The Prime Minister himself showed his complete lack of understanding of the epidemic of violence against women in this country when he had to ask his own wife what to do. And this year, when the friends of Kate found their voice on her behalf and presented a 30-page dossier of allegations against the Attorney-General, the government moved again to silence Kate. The Prime Minister didn't even read the allegations. He didn't even read them. He didn't read them before he declared that he had asked the Attorney-General if it was true. He said no, and that was the end of it. Well, the women of Australia have showed today that this is not the end of it. We have seen today that this is not the end of anything. What we've seen today is the women of Australia say loudly and clearly that enough is enough. There is a rawness and a rage in our country today because the women of Australia have had enough. They've had enough of being silenced, enough of being disrespected, enough of seeing machines roll out against them when they try to speak up. There is a conversation going on today about violence against women, and it is getting louder. It's in our schools, it's in our workplaces, it's in the corridors of this very building, it's in the streets. And the only people who are choosing not to be part of that conversation is this government, the Morrison government, the very people who should be leading the way. Thank you, uh, Senator Walsh. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McAllister to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Um, Senator, yes, you're seeking the call? Yes, yes. Waters. Yes, Senator Waters, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Deputy President. Um, I uh, move to take note of the answers given to me uh, to my question to Senator Birmingham. Um, and I just want to firstly thank everyone that's spoken today and everyone that took the time to go to the March for Justice today right across the country. There were a good 100,000 people, men, women, people of all genders, young people, people of colour, um, people who hold, held some fabulous signs and people who spoke with such courage and grace and strength. It was an incredibly uplifting and enraging all at once moment. So firstly, my, my deep gratitude goes to those who've spoken out um, on these issues. But the Prime Minister didn't go along to the rally today and I asked Senator Birmingham, who represents the Prime Minister in this chamber, well, why on earth not? Some people had come from miles away to be at the march today and the Prime Minister wouldn't even yeah. find 10 minutes in his diary to walk out and to listen to them. Now, I listened to the speakers 
There were many people from other political parties that were there listening as well, and they were powerful words. The Prime Minister should have been there. He should have been listening to those speakers, and he should listen to women, full stop. He didn't do that, and I'm very disappointed that the Minister for Women was not at the rally today either. It sadly speaks volumes. Um, and once again, I commend the strength of all those who spoke um, at the march today. Now, I tabled a petition that 70,000 people had signed, and one of the asks of that petition was for some action on a now 14-month-old report that the Sex Discrimination Commissioner prepared and tabled last year about sexual harassment in all workplaces. It's called Respect at Work, and there's 55 recommendations. And my question to the government was, well, how many of those recommendations are you acting on? Now, at the very end of the time to answer that question, I got um, a sort of response. Minister, uh, Minister Birmingham said a number of those recommendations. Well, I want all of them acted on. The women of Australia deserve all of those recommendations to be adopted and implemented, and it's not good enough to use a pandemic as an excuse to not progress gender equality. You've progressed an awful lot of other dastardly policies. You've found time to do that, but you haven't found time to keep women safe, and you haven't found time to bring in a federal corruption watchdog. The things that you don't want to do, you've used the pandemic as an excuse to not do, for shame. Now, I then asked about the uh, Prime Minister's ministerial standards, because you wouldn't really know it, but they, there's meant to be some standards. They're written down in a document. They're not actually uh, used, in my view, but they are written down. And they say that ministers are meant to act with integrity, accountability and in the public interest. And they even foresee the Prime Minister conducting an independent inquiry when it looks like maybe those standards have not been met. So there is a process there that could be used by the Prime Minister to look at whether his minister, Minister Porter, is in fact acting with uh, integrity, accountability and in the public interest. But instead we get this absolute nonsense from the Prime Minister and some of his other lackeys that it would be against the rule of law to have such an inquiry. Well, it's, nobody believes that. That is the most ridiculous assertion we've ever heard. An investigation under the Prime Minister's ministerial standards about whether the Attorney-General is a fit person to remain in that role is a separate question to the investigation of the alleged rape by police and other authorities. The two can happen simultaneously, or they could happen, except, of course, the woman took her own life. And we know that, sadly, the justice system is misnamed for so many people who seek justice and are denied it, um, including Kate. So we've had this nonsense about the rule of law, um, saying that an independent investigation isn't possible. Well, that didn't stop the High Court. Um, it, it, it doesn't stop the private sector, uh, it didn't stop the Law Council, it didn't stop sporting clubs. There is so much precedent for having an independent inquiry. There is specific mention of the ability to do so in the Prime Minister's ministerial standards, but he continues to refuse to uphold those standards. Now, I, um, I just thought it was terrible timing and another insult to women that Minister Porter chose today to sue Louise uh, Milligan, um, and ABC for running the Four Corners episode, um, which alluded to uh, the fact that he had some serious questions to answer. Of all days, when women are hitting the streets asking to be heard and listened to, Minister Porter wants to silence them with a defamation action that the Prime Minister may or may not have asked for. Um, Minister Birmingham didn't think so, but you know it wasn't entirely clear. Do better. The women of Australia have had enough. We are sick of this government. We are sick of the patriarchy, and we're coming for you. Question is: Motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are there any?